So this uh, presentation covers a model called, uh, internally normally, the V-Track Formation Model. It sounds a bit grand, really, uh, but I'll give you the, what the scope of the model actually is. Um, it's been developed over a period, but it has enjoyed a recent period of further development, um, not currently being developed. So it's an opportunity, really, this morning to take stock a little bit, give you a bit of a state-of-the-art review, and perhaps have a look where this kind of modelling might be going in the future. As originally specified, uh, the requirement was to produce a life cycle cost model for the track system, those determined by formation and track bed. And obviously the intention was to derive a network budget, be it for the next year, the next control period or whatever. It found a logical home in the emerging vehicle track interaction strategic model that Joss uh, mentioned. Now, of course, once you've got a model of that nature, which gives you the relationship between the inputs and the outputs being the cost, you've kind of then developed yourself a tool where you can play tunes and perhaps try to reduce uh, ownership costs. So that's really, to some extent, first part is done. The opportunity now is to move more to the second part. This model actually covers that bit of the network, which we might say normal, whatever normal may be, when we talk formation, track work and so on, we're normally talking about all those problem sites. This model kind of puts those a little bit on one side and tries to deal with the majority of the, of the more normal stuff. Just looking quickly at the timeline, um, some elements of the model go back a long way, back to the days of British Rail Research and so on. Um, but really the model came to fruition uh, with the introduction of VTism in around 2005. And over that period, it's received financial sponsorship from RSSB through the research budget and through Network Rail, who essentially are the owner now of this technology. And the Systems Interface <coughs> Committees were very supportive in steering the project and uh, generating enthusiasm for funding. Various contractors have contributed towards the development of this model. And but really, it's the fact that I've worked over the years on and off on this model for various of these contractors seems to be the reason why I'm stood here telling you about it now. Looking at the basic functions of, of this model, essentially we have two primary elements. One is the track geometry deterioration that comes from ballast settlement, and that drives tamping and stone blowing volumes and costs. And then the other element is ballast life prediction, so the renewal side of the equation. The if you like, the track geometry de deterioration is the biggest single maintenance element and the ballast replacement is amongst the biggest renewal element. So this model alone is covering quite a bit of the, of the track deterioration area, although other elements are actually within Vitism as well. And how it achieves this, the primary functions, we have derivation of wheel rail forces, static and dynamic. We've had a bit of that already this morning. What we're really interested in is what are the forces between the sleeper and ballast? They're what's driving the deterioration of the track bed. And we have algorithms which predict the evolution of track standard deviation over time. And then with our specified intervention standards, effectively then we're determining in what frequency we need to do work and uh, therefore how much that work will cost. And there are actually intelligent algorithms in there as well for the tamping versus stone blowing decision. And on the ballast life side, we use the kind of long established ballast fouling model, which basically says when the uh, voids in the ballast are clogged, the ballast is life expired. And we basically quantify the individual contributions to uh, fines generation, loading by traffic, damage from mechanical maintenance, and dropped and environmental fines coming in from outside. And each of those are quantified as a rate per million gross tonne or whatever it may be based upon research going back into the past. Formation failure itself is not modelled, that's considered to be on the too difficult pile for this type of model. But you can probably get a guess from the description there that some elements of the model are fundamental and some are more sort of empirical in nature. And this model of course is aimed primarily at the GB National Railway Network. So what we're trying to do is have these fundamental models but then also capture the current condition of the asset and that's a vital part of the uh, process that I'll also try and outline for you. Some of the inputs we need, we uh, classify the traffic, volume of traffic and its characteristics, axle load, 
um, suspension characteristics, etc. We quantify the structural characteristics of the track. What section of rail have we got? Is it jointed CWR, switching crossing work? What sleeper type, timber, steel, concrete? What sleeper spacing? And what track support stiffness? And that's in red because we basically don't know. So it's a vital ingredient to the calculation and yet we don't really know it. We know specific values, as Brian was explaining earlier, but for every individual piece of track, we really don't have a clue what its stiffness is and yet it's an important parameter. And some of the track condition elements, another thing we don't know is the rail surface geometry. Dip angles caused by welding, joints, wheel burns, all that sort of thing. We fundamentally don't know. We can measure a specific piece of track and we can take average values. But again, across the whole network, we don't know what that, uh, what that input is and that drives the dynamic loading. We can quantify the current track geometry condition and rate of deterioration from track recording car data and that's what we attempt to do. And in principle we know the age of ballast because it's documented although there are some some reliability issues with that data. So here's a schematic of the sort of model function really, I won't labour it too much but on the left it does at least show you the data sets that are used in the uh, GB sense. So we have net traff data gives us the traffic information, joggis information uh, Joggis data comes from uh, infrastructure. The track condition we can quantify from the age of ballast in Joggis and the HSTRC um, track quality type of information. And we input the track quality targets, the standards to be met. Um, what you can actually do is specify the standards to be met and calculate the resources to deliver, or you can constrain the resources and see what track quality might result from that. And then you have the sort of engine of the model and the primary outputs, the predicted geometry and deterioration rate and the ballast condition. Those leading in turn to the volume of tamping required and the ballast residual life and the ballast renewal volume. There is actually a semi-empirical level two exceedances and um, temporary speed restriction and delays uh, module in the, in the bigger model, in the Vitaism model. Um, but I'm not, I'm not aware that that's very regularly used. And basically Network Rail have several implementations of this basic fundamental principle. Um, so the model lives in Vitaism, but the principles do also get used elsewhere. An example output, so here we see for a 15 year forward prediction uh, for a sample piece of track, uh, the renewal volume uh, by work type. And it's this is a Vitaism output, so it also shows you the additional work that it's put in for rail replacement and sleeper replacement is, uh, is there. And basically the, um, the work volume is determined by the work requirement and the individual work elements are worked out in part by the policies that apply and in part by a more empirical approach, for example, how much track excavation versus ballast cleaning you may do uh, in a, at a particular time. And in this example we, we see a predicted bow wave of some 13, 14 years and it's useful to know those sorts of things and it may have resulted from some major renewal or enhancements that happened in the recent past will then give you a bow wave into the future that you may uh, need to know about as a result of the cost peak that will come with it. I mentioned sort of calibration exercise that starts at the outset and here's one example of it. Um, we basically make a prediction of the evolution of track geometry over time and that's the blue line. And then we compare that to the track recording car data, that's the red squares. And we would normally look at a, if you like, a maintenance period. So we have the deterioration phase there and we'd normally record the improvement and the subsequent deterioration. So intelligence has to be applied to separate it down to the fundamentals and we get the deterioration curve and the deterioration behaviour. And not surprisingly between model and reality we get a difference. Um, and the simple way to correct for the difference is to apply a scaling factor in the model. Um, and so the question is what's the justification for a scaling factor? It became broken down into two fundamental factors. One, the first one is called the ballast condition factor, or BCF. 
that's actually time varying. So over time or accumulation of traffic, the VCF will vary and I'll show you the function in a minute. But it reflects the fact that as the ballast becomes more contaminated with fines, its, uh, its performance deteriorates as Peter's data was also showing earlier. And we have this second factor called the local track section factor. And that effectively represents a package of all the stuff we don't know about what's going on in the ground. So it's a constant um, parameter and it's unchanged at track renewal. And some of the validation work that's been done over the years and recently is telling us that this is reasonably correct. So we've got the ballast condition factor deteriorates over time, the local track section factor stays the same even if you renew the track suggesting that it's really a formation-based um, parameter. And that, those two parameters are calculated when the model is run at, at its outset for every single eighth mile on the network. We use eighth miles to coincide with the track geometry um, aggregation distance. So effectively, every piece of the network has a defined BCF and LTSF um, parameter. And so the question is, are they of any use? Let's just have a look at the function itself. This is the BCF function. And when the model was originally uh, conceived, basically this was postulated as being probably what happens based upon observed behavior. So we have the life of the ballast from zero to one, if you like the normalized length of time, which normally would represent 20 years or more of ballast life. And the BCF is the multiplier that applies to the rate of deterioration of the track. So it's said here that it starts at 1 and then it starts to increase. And by the nominal end of life it re reaches 2 and it's gone up a bit of a ski jump. And again some of the recent validation work has broadly supported that as being a, an appropriate function. It's actually been refined a little bit as a result of that investigation. Um, and there is some still technical debate, is there a flat phase in the early years of ballast where um, there's no increase in rate of deterioration and what happens when x is greater than 1, when ballast is beyond life expiry, which is something we do have to deal with. So some further debate um, taking place over the function of BCF, but we believe that's broadly correct. Here is the LTSF data plotted out, so it's whole network calculated LTSF value um, plotted out, in this case by territory, you can break it down however you like. And first thing to observe, it follows something looking like a normal distribution. In fact, when LTSF is presented as it is here as a log, um, it fits almost spot on to a normal distribution, which is perhaps what you might expect uh, for this kind of calculation process. The mean of LTSF is around 1, it's 50 percentile value is about 0.75. And then we have on the right hand side where LTSF is greater than the 50 percentile, we have all the problem sites, the ones that are performing apparently somewhat worse than the norm. And the 95 percentile value of LTSF is about 1.5. And co co correspondingly on the left, we have uh, the well-performing sites um, and the 5 percentile value of LTSF is about 0.37. So essentially we get a four-fold four change over the range of LTSF value. So if, if this is purely a, an empirical fudge factor we're applying, it's of little significance. If it's actually something fundamental and physical and important, it, it is actually very important because what it's saying is we've got tracks which are performing four times as bad in some cases than in others and if we can make those perform more like the good ones then there's potentially significant cost savings to be had. Incidentally the LTSF parameter is very consistent when plotted across track categories so it suggests that the normalisation part of the model that does the speed and the axle load and the tonnage and all that thing is actually working quite well. So let's look at the case, if you like, for arithmetic fudge factor versus something more engineering and physical. The sort of things that 
contribute to LTSF are input data errors and ballast age has been a problem. Um, sometimes it's quoted and it's accurate, sometimes it's quoted and it's inaccurate, and sometimes it's plain wrong and that can confuse the calculation. We take um, traffic volume at year zero as a download from the database. We don't try and reconstruct historic traffic patterns which may be a, a limitation in certain cases. Obviously there can be fundamental shortcomings in the, in the model and that is recognised. And we can get errors in the fit at this calibration stage. Not all sites show the classic sawtooth deterioration curve of deterioration, improvement, deterioration, uh, particularly where there are problem formations, uh, shrink swell, all that kind of thing that can go on and confuse um, the normal behaviour. And we do get errors where the track recording data is not long, longitudinally synchronised. Um, it just builds in mathematical error. On the physical side of the equation, uh, we said that we don't know what the rail surface geometry is, um, and that means the number and severity of welds and joints in a particular track section. We don't know the influence of track features, what we call track features that uh, may be in the formation that transitions onto under bridges, under track crossings of various sorts, all this type of thing that we know affect the performance of the track but again we don't have the data uh, to drive uh, whether it's there or it's not there or what effect it has. In the models there is a strong relationship with track stiffness um, but as I mentioned earlier we don't have the data to drive it with so we've got if you like a powerful model but no data to drive it with and there are factors like the influence of moisture content and drainage which we don't we just don't have it in quantifiable form uh, to be able to take account of. At the moment, it appears to be the, the much talked about track stiffness, which appears to be the single biggest factor that's driving LTSF. And the mechanism, as, as mentioned earlier, elasticity of the track formation causes high strains in the ballast and therefore settlement of the ballast. And if you've got soft or variable formation, uh, you get higher rates of deterioration in the ballast. And if you renew the ballast, you don't reset that in any way. You carry on with the same uh, unfortunate deterioration cycle. We also believe as well, uh, based upon work that we've done, that it is the physical components that are driving LTSF and not the more mathematical, uh, arithmetical ones. But we do acknowledge that this sort of normal distribution of LTSF kind of represents our lack of knowledge, if you like, and some of the work that's been going on has been trying to reduce that scatter, if you like, and try and be more precise and uh, numerical about um, quantifying the contributions to LTSF. So we're suggesting that LTSF is actually a useful parameter and more of a form formation performance index than a um, an empirical fudge factor and we believe that understanding and managing LTSF offers us a route to cost reduction. We also think that the term LTSF needs a bit of a makeover really if it's going to be used uh, more productively in the future. A couple of model use examples for you. The first one really is about looking at the influence of vehicle pa uh, parameters on track costs and it looked at parameters like the axle load, unsprung mass etc. Slightly less interest to us here today, but it was carried forward into procurement of new rolling stock, trying to drive uh, the industry to more favourable parameters. The second um, project, RSSB T807, was a bit more interesting because it looked at the influence of track parameters on whole life costs. And some conclusions I pick from that report, you can search it for it yourself if you wish. Basically, a 20% improvement in LTSF equated to around a 7% um, improvement in total track maintenance and renewal costs. That's UK-wide something like £2 billion pounds of cost. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of money in LTSF. And some practical conclusions, geogrids and sleeper soffit pads were uh, assessed by the model and were considered to offer a quick payback of around five years or less uh, when used in appropriate circumstances. The slightly more um, complicated 
uh, and thorough formation treatments like lime stabilisation, piling and so on, are potentially very effective but also of course expensive. The payback period there is sort of in the 15 years plus sort of territory. So in both cases probably justifiable on financial grounds but obviously in an industry which is always nervous about first costs um, it's difficult to justify the work. I won't summarise the totality of this um, chart which shows us some of the recent work and the sort of conclusions. It's worth highlighting just the first one though where we looked at the influence of track stiffness. Um, what we actually did was use the uh, automatic ballast sampling data that Phil was showing us earlier and we tried to infer from that what is the material and therefore what's its modulus and stiffness and we got a very good uh, relationship with LTSF. In other words where we had soft um, materials we got poor performance and vice versa. So potentially if we get track stiffness capabilities which is emerging in the industry and we've got cost effective <coughs> means of treating deficient track stiffness uh, we've probably got a potentially useful route to uh, track cost savings. So to summarise the existing implementation of the track formation model has been shown to work well and produce uh, informative results. So the original objective has kind of been achieved, the model that calculates costs is there, and the question is then, now there are opportunities to apply the knowledge learned from the model, and recent findings support the thought that track stiffness is the largest single influence of track bed underperformance. There are one or two others, but track stiffness seems to be the big one. And further understanding involving the empirical factor LTSF offers the potential for significant ownership cost reduction. So maybe uh, we could be moving towards looking at the LTSF values as part of renewal decision making is the problem in the formation or the ballast. LTSF can help tell us. And we need to be thinking about cost effective remediation of high LTSF sites. And the sort of work that Peter was describing could be going towards that sort of conclusion. There are a number of if you like, potential future activities were documented as part of the recent work that was uh, in network rail ownership and I don't think they're being secretive about it. My suggestion is that the um, Track Stiffness Working Group would be a good forum to kind of discuss such things and take this forward. But that's me finished and thank you very much.